Hello and welcome to the CGC show on AETV. AETV is the voice of higher education in Africa. We are coming to you live from the headquarters of the Association of African Universities here in Accra, Ghana. My name is Ajaomi and I am going to be your host. And I know we've been away for quite a while now, but we are back and today we are going to be discussing a very interesting um, career path. Of course, my guest is ready and I'm also ready. And I hope that you tell a friend to tell a friend to tell another friend to tune in to join in the conversation. You can follow the conversation on our social media platforms at a underscore TV on Twitter, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and at a TV official on Instagram. My name is Aja Omi and the show is proudly brought to you by the Association of African Universities. We'll be back after the break. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. Welcome back. If you just tuned in, you are watching the CGC show on AAU TV. And today we'll be discussing gynecology as a career. My guest is in the person of Mr. Kojo Owusu Ansa. And he is actually a gynecologist. He's been practicing for close to 14 years. And um, he's here to tell us more about gynecology as a career. Welcome on the show. Thank you. I'm Glad so to be honored here. to have you. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about yourself. I'd want you to tell me more who you are, what you do, and all of that. Okay, so my name is Kojo Sansa, as you mentioned. Um, born in Kumasi okay. in the 70s. <laughs> Grew up in Kumasi. So as a basic education, primary education there. And then I had second education in Accra, precisely gone. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Kenya UST for university, tra um, UST um, training. training. And did medicine practice for a while then socialize in gynecology. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you did medicine for six years. Yes. So did medicine for at six years. What specific time at what specific specific point in time did you choose that okay, I'm going to do gynecology? Well the, the decision to do gynecology came right after came after medical school. In fact active in after housemanship. Okay. Uh, worked there was a medical officer after getting a full license. Then I realized that, well, um, of all the disciplines I've been through in terms of rotations and house job exposure, um, I like gynecology where it seems more results oriented mm -hmm. in terms of, and it's a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I like that part. Okay. And yeah. you've been practicing for 14 years? Yes, uh, including residency training days 14. Okay. But I've been, since especially, or since being certified, it's been 10 years since. It's been 10 years. Mm -hmm. How has it been for you in this COVID era? How are you handling your patients to make sure that they don't come with the infection, you also don't get the infection? Well, generally in the, in the clinic, the same uh, concepts apply. Social distancing, mm -hmm. you have outpatient facilities that take a few people at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, the general hand washing, cleaning setups at every entrance at the clinic. Okay. And then um, usually mask being put on at all times in the clinic, as well as a usual um, lab coat or mm. a clinical wear or indoor scraps that we use, yeah, mm. which are already designed to prevent infection to begin with. Then we have, if you do have a suspected case, the usual PPEs, okay. you know, come in, as in the full mm. hazmat suit and the mm. boots and everything, yeah. Okay. We use that. So that we've used so far to handle the. As for, and yes, we've had 
patients coming with COVID, mm -hmm. both gynecological and pregnant women as well. And okay. we've handled them as and when they come with the appropriate measures. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I must say that you've done really, really well. <laughs> but I want to know what, um, what's informed your decision to be a gynecologist? Well, <laughs> that would be, okay, let me see. When I was in medical school, okay. uh, I think one of the most memorable experiences came from when I got to the gynae unit. Though it was initially confusing, having to take care of women and then take care of a woman and a baby. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. With time, I realized that it proved to be pretty much straightforward in terms of analyzing the case. The diagnosis were pretty much straightforward. It is or it's not. Uh -huh. there, were, there were very few gray areas, I mean, at that level, as a medical mm -hmm. student for me. And we felt it was very well, well resource oriented. You know, you could see pregnant women come, go through their trimesters of pregnancy, and deliver a month or two, or maybe a year later, I see their mother, the baby. You know, you get mm. a sense of accomplishment yeah. of having helped someone. So I felt like, okay, well, this looks like something I could stay in for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I went there. So you mentioned that you get that sense of establishment. Aside that, what is your goal as a gynecologist? Well, the main goal is, is to provide um, optimum health okay. or for mother and then baby. And the baby. Usually the broad specialty is gynecology and a small subset of the specialty is obstetrics where we take care of pregnant women for the nine, ten months that they are pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So usually you are looking at providing the best of health care for the woman. Uh -huh with all the, the sen high sense of professionalism, skills, knowledge, empathy, with the privacy, everything. Combined. That, that's the general aim, you know. Um, with every patient, you will have specific problems with specific maybe treatment goals or management goals, mm -hmm. yeah. So depending on what the issue is, yes, we, we, mm -hmm. we can go further. But then I've moved on to do uh, more training in um, infertility and then assisted conception as well as uh, minimal access surgery. Oh, okay, so even in the gynecology, you can. We have some special sub okay. subdivisions, yeah. Okay, so, so you have chosen to specialize. Yeah, so I'm um, now fertility and then minimal surgery inclined. Okay, but you attend to other patients. Yeah, I do general. I do general. General, so. okay. Mm. But you cho it's, it comes out of interest. Like maybe you feel out of the lot of patients you have. Mm -hmm. This is the area you're more comfortable. So it's an optional thing. It's not okay. for. It's not mandatory. Yeah, but mm -hmm. then yes. As a gynecologist, you've been through the medical school and all of that. From the basic level, what are some of the courses that you think um, students or people who would want to become gynecologists? What are some of the courses that you would want them to take seriously? From the basic level through to the medical school probably after medical school training, whatever? Well, basic, basic level, it, it's all fun. I mean, <laughs> primary school is just fun. Okay. <laughs> so I think it, it's, it's, it's probably a bit too early mm. to, to put emphasis there. Okay. But when you get to the secondary school, that's where probably you should look at. You obviously must be in a science-related mm. course. What about course, you first of all have to do medicine. What of? Home economics. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that, oh, but you, you, you have to do some science-related course. Like and biology? Exactly, biology, mathematics, some chemistry, some physics, okay. integrated science, something, okay. to aim at entering a medical school. Because usually the first aim is to come out with a medical degree. Okay. Then from there you go into residency or postgraduate training into a specialty of your choice. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I think the first hurdle will be becoming a doctor. Doctor. Uh -huh. And with that, any science-related course is okay. Mm -hmm. At days, it used to be strictly biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But with time, other schools have what we call a graduate entry program. Okay. Where you can do a BS in biology, BS in chemistry, BS in any petroleum, chemistry, anything that is science-related. And come and enter as a graduate right. into a medical school program. Okay. Then become a doctor. 
So that's the evolving trend. You trend. don't have to start In the medical from school. the pure science at that level. You could oh, do okay. any science, even agricultural science, can come into medical school as graduate entry and then finish four years as a doctor. Interesting. Yeah. It's something that pertain in the West, but mm. it's, it's come here now. It's coming here now. So now it's not for our days. You should, you should start mm. straight from early secondary school mm. and turn into a science related background. But now you could do whatever you do finish basic university degree, biochemistry, food nutrition, anything science related. Okay. And then dive, even BS in nursing, come and enter medical school as a graduate and then do a graduate medical entry program. I think it's, it's quite interesting and a mm. very good thing because some, mostly some students could go to school, be in medical school and they will still not know what exactly they want to do. They can even be in other fields and they would still not know what exactly they would want to do. Yeah. And somebody may also have the passion to be a gynecologist, but he or she do not have the brains, like we say, uh -huh, <laughs> to go into the medical school. So if you are saying that they can do any science-related course in the university and enter as a graduate. Um, that is, if you don't get to enter at the beginning, be beginning. there's another entry Tree. point okay. later on mm -hmm. in the graduate entry program. But don't you think that that's going to be a challenge if the person didn't get the basic No, um, I've, I've, had, I've had people are doctors now who finished, one even did petroleum chemistry, mm. was in oil and gas and then divert into medical school. So. It's, 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 it's now opened up. Okay. Uh -huh. Some wanted to be that, but maybe the selection or entry uh, criteria at medical school at that time maybe excluded them. So end up doing something else. Mm. I've seen a nurse who finished Lego and BS in nursing. They enter medical school, practice as a physician in the US. It's a doctor now. Interesting. So it's, 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 there are several channels, so mm. you could, you could, if you miss the chance now, once you do well, maybe I think first, first, first class or maybe second degree mm. upper, you can still come back mm. and tough. Okay, that's, yeah. that's mm. good. So, if you are going to go through the normal process of being a gynecologist, maybe from, from secondary school, studying general science or any science related, uh -huh. How long do you think it would take for somebody to become a professional gynecologist? Well, um, the training itself in most countries ranges from three to seven years. That's a training. After medical school? Yes, that's a postgraduate training that makes you a gynecologist. Okay. But if you're adding all years from maybe, maybe let's, let's say from secondary school, which is now three essentially. Years. Yeah junior high, senior high, so like six years. Then university, which is, if it's straight entry into medical school, that would be six, six years. years, making another 12. <laughs> uh -huh. Then after six years for a basic medical degree, after which you have to do a housemanship, which is like a, an apprenticeship kind of mm -hmm. training where you are attached. So you don't do national service? That's quote unquote like a national okay. service. So you go through the rotations under your superiors, for a period of two years, then you get your full final medical license. Then you can practice on your own after yeah. that. Uh -huh. So that adds on to another two years, 14, mm -hmm. before you decide, okay, I want to do specialize. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If the interest is there, because it's, it's aside the medical qualifications or academic qualifications, you need to have the passion for it because it can get stressful uh -huh. and it can get quite demanding emotionally, physically, psychologically. Yeah. So you need to have the orientation for it as well. I see. And um, can you tell me how um, you've been able to manage? You mentioned just right now that it can be really stressful. How have you been able to balance it with your work? Your work, of course, your leisure time, having time to to hang out with friends, family, how do you do that? <laughs> well, it comes with uh, time management, okay. trying to know what to attend to when. Um, but generally in medicine, uh, it's hard to predict, depending on what, what specialty area you are. For my 
specialty, um, the key thing is time management. Knowing how to do your clinics, combine maybe surgical days, emergency days, you know, with your personal life or social life. But that said and done, uh, it's one of the disciplines that you should be prepared to get disrupted from your social. comfortable life okay. any day because of the nature of our emergencies. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you could finish, have a long day. If you happen to be the one on call, no matter the hours you've done earlier, get home two, three hours, another emergency pops up, which will require your physical presence. So you need to leave mm -hmm. and attend. So then obviously that makes your, door, your day extra long. You know. um, so you should prepare to have those sacrificial uh -huh, okay. things. If you're not ready for that, then probably it's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> you may have the passion for it, but... Exactly, it's because it's going to text you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because if you're the kind that you love your sleep, well, I've had 12 days, don't disturb like me. myself. <laughs> That's not for you, because okay. that your 12 hours doesn't guarantee you're going to have a nice sleep. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay. So, um, I would want you to tell me, I don't know, but I've, I've seen that... We were having a conversation, actually, off camera, and you mentioned that this is actually a male-dominated um, career path or a profession. Yes, it is. Why is it so? <laughs> I'm curious. Well, maybe opposites attract. <laughs> well, it's hard to but, say, but you see, um, I say maybe opposites attract. That's the only way that I could sort of explain no. why <laughs> why <laughs> men end up in the field, you know. But it would be very difficult to explain. I, I still don't understand why. Well, okay, well, if I go back to statistics, mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of enrollment, from the earlier days, it used to be males enrolling medical school more than ladies. There were very few women doing medicine, okay? And combining career with um, family life, some, what I saw initially, some ladies, either after medical degree, decided not to continue, did something relatively light or less stressful, okay. maybe public health or some something, family, something, or even stop that basic medical degree and did general practice the rest of their life in order to be able to combine family life and then their careers. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But with time, we have increased enrollment in females in medical school, increased enrollment even in specialising, because some also never specialised, because they thought it was another long leg of school work mm -hmm. and everything yeah so yes i think with time as the enrollment increase and the increase women in postgraduate training comes yes and we've seen that for the past 10 years when i was training there were a handful of women as we speak today amongst my trainees mm -hmm. i'll say about maybe 50 percent or more are women i see yeah so i mean in the 10 years since i qualified because I think my class, when we qualified, there was only one lady. Okay. And then now, the class that's just, those who just graduated, let's say, they're about six or seven or eight. So there's, it's, it's coming up. It's coming up. Yes, maybe giving them a 10 more years, there'll mm -hmm. be a fair even distribution. That's what's going to be a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would want you to tell me how um, you, you handle emergencies. Has there been any case where um, you would have an emergency and you, you'll be attending to an emergency and another emergency would come and you will need to attend to that same person because probably the other person that's around is a female and the person wouldn't want a female to attend to him or her? To her. Oh, um, generally we work in teams. So... In my team, I'm not the only one. The other equally competent doctors also physically present. So if I have an emergency, depending on the nature of them, some emergencies require more than one hand. So you call for help. Okay. Uh -huh. Because maybe she's bleeding torrentially. You can't handle it alone. Uh -huh. So it depends on the nature of the emergency. You know, even in emergencies, they are graded. There are some where die emergency, some are the moderate. Uh -huh. mm. If I'm handling one that is not so bad and some other one comes, so I could detail another colleague to do. Uh -huh. Generally, people who need emergency care are not fussy. Mm -hmm. They cannot say, I want the man, I don't want the man. Unless it's a cultural setup, like 
Islam. Some, mm. some don't want men examining. So usually the husband would object. Mm -hmm. I want a female to take off my, pay, off my wife. Uh -huh. But generally, the person you need in the care is usually not too particular about. Mm -hmm. I want male or more female. Okay. But at that point, I tend to think that if you are picky about who you want to see, then you're not probably sick. Obviously. Yes, because you are conscious enough yes. to choose who wants to see you. Yeah, that means you are not probably sick. You are not as bad as we thought. Mm -hmm. But generally, when you're in emergency, you don't really care who is coming to you. All you need is someone who is competent enough, irrespective of gender, to help you. And, and has, there, has there been any case where um, probably the person will say, I would want you to attend to me, when in actual fact you are attending to somebody else? Probably your patient. Somebody that's like, oh, yes, we, we, <laughs> yeah, you get that sometimes. You get people pointing out, I want you to take care of me. So, how do you handle situations like well, that? Well, yes, sir. Well, I'll get back to you when I'm done. I'm with someone, and then, yes, you know, they would usually wouldn't demand it, but they will say, maybe I want this, or I want mm -hmm. that. Usually, those are maybe outpatient cases who are pretty stable and really don't mm -hmm. think can pick and choose, you know. So, yes, you do get that sometimes. Mm, okay. I would want you to talk about some of the challenges and also share probably your most, like your most um, interesting experience with us. But we'll do that after the break. Okay. So um, we'll be back after the break. Stay tuned. watching the CBC show on AE TV and we have been discussing gynecology as a career path. My guest, um, Dr. Kujo Owusu-Ansan, has delved into the issue. He's talked about how long it will take you to become a professional gynecologist. He's also highlighted some of the challenges he himself faces, balancing um, work and his social life. He's talked about some um, emergencies, how to handle emergency um, situations and all of that. But I'm going to ask you, Dr. Kujo Usansa, I would want you to tell me some of the challenges in general that you think the profession is facing currently. Well, I think um, the biggest challenge usually is got to do with logistics for us to work with in terms of space for patients. First of all, where I work, I work in Kolebu, which is the main referral center okay. for this hospital, for this country. Um, we do with very large volumes, human volumes, uh -huh, and patient load. So having occasionally a few shortages, challenges, getting things done with everything from things to work with, sometimes even to blood products being available. Mm. Those are challenges that pop up every now and then. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. And what do you think can be done to... To reduce that? Well, I think that um, with regard to things to work with, um, what, what we've seen over time is that we need some support, usually from maybe some bigger body, let's say government or even other quasi government or even corporate bodies okay. who support. Let's say we have a very not so big labor award. Um, we are looking at um, expansion. Well, there's a new maternity block coming up, you know, so hopefully that will solve most of the mm -hmm. space constraints mm -hmm. and the large volumes we have to deal with. Uh, with also blood, um, blood donations will help get increase the stock at the bank. Those are real challenges we have to taking care of patients, you know, drug shortages every now and then, you know. It's getting better now anyway, but then mm -hmm. those are the main issues. Issues, yeah. yeah. And um, share with us your most interesting experience so far in the game. You've been practicing for 14 <laughs> years or there 10 years. <laughs> there, are, there are several of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which one do I say? Okay. Okay, share two with us. So, uh, most interesting experience. Hmm. 
we've had scenarios where I'm not going to say names or <laughs> anything, but uh, of course. general scenarios where we've had to sort of take care of um, patients who have, let's say, a lot of, I won't say it's maybe secrets that uh, partners are not aware of. But you get drawn in because you are the professional. Okay. Uh -huh. So you've seen scenarios where you realize that there's disputes in paternity, you know, and then you are, get, you are drawn in, and then uh, issues where um, maybe some partners are trying to come with a story that we have to, we have to, we are drawn in, sort of confirm or refute. Mm. You know, we've had very, maybe tight corners, I should put it that way, where they put you where you have to, mm. you know. But then usually what I tend to do is that um, my allegiance is to my patient. Of course. So usually when third parties come in, I tend to ignore third parties and deal with the patient who are going to their wishes, mm. sort of. So, but that said and done, we've had some very close calls to, I mean, in terms of emergencies, people, you know, or near misses, if I should put it that way. You know. that, that, that makes you feel more, um, feel more fulfilled in terms of maybe, because what if maybe somebody close to losing the person and then you come in, make a emergency surgery, all that, and then you save the person there. That gives you a more greater sense of fulfillment. I see, interesting. Um, I would want you to tell me, do you think technology, you know, right now it's all about, everything is about technology, even names in it. How do you think technology has improved your sector? Yeah, it has. I mean, in a lot of ways. I mean, technology helped us in uh, even the equipment that we use, monitoring babies, monitoring mothers fetal monitors and all that. Mm. Um, in our surgical work, making surgery more easier and more safer, from anesthesia to even the surgery itself. So we're looking at even presently, the thing is minimal access or cosmetic keyhole surgeries and all that, yeah. It's all technologically based. Okay. Even to the era of COVID where everything we thought could not be done, can be done online, mm -hmm. including teaching sessions, meetings, conferences, everything. So it's really helped us make it, the world smaller, you know, uh, and also helped us. Internet helped us a lot, terms of resources to mm. learn, to train, yeah. Because in the days, you used to have, have to have a library, have an access, even for trainees coming up. Now everything's on the net, mm. closer to you than you ever think, uh, and probably a bit cheaper. Yeah, so now it's made it a lot of things easier. Why, why do you think that the, this profession in particular has not gained much, much reputation like other professions? Talk, when, we, when we are talking about medical doctors, mm -hmm. it, it probably won't cross your mind to say, okay, I'm going to see a gynecologist. Like, these are people that are obviously re relevant, but they don't, they are not they are not so much out there. I don't know how to put it for you to understand. <laughs> Just like how lawyers, you go to lawyers. Okay. You know, lawyers are prominent people. Uh -huh. Medical practitioners in general are uh -huh. prominent people. But when it comes to gynecologists, you don't hear them as often as you hear the other professions. Well, okay, I'll put it this way. Um, you don't hear the real ones as often as... <laughs> we have a lot... It's one of the most copied or maybe one of the most disciplines that has a lot of quote-unquote imposters. Okay. Where a lot of people profess to want to, oh, I do women, I do fertility, I do a lot of them in there. Mm. Uh -huh. But by virtue of the work and the nature of the job, uh, the real ones are probably not so loud, but they are there. Mm. You know? So, yes. And I think culturally, too, there's a mindset of every doctor is a doctor. Yeah, that's true. So <laughs> that's also, if you tell somebody you're a specialist, you go like, ah, what is that? Mm. You know, because they find it strange that, ah, I'm telling you about my hand, you're telling me that's not your area. area. Okay. You know, it's, 
I don't know where that came we from. We feel you are, as a medical doctor, you should be able exactly. To. But after some years, if you specialize, certain things are very mm -hmm. great. Like you don't even remember, you know, because you see more of what you are used to. Uh -huh. But it's hard for the people to understand that. To understand that they bring their child to you, and I'm not a pediatrician. Like, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You look at the child, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and it's, 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 I don't know. It's so but because, okay. So I think that with time, um, people should realize that. Maybe because specialization wasn't a big thing in the past. Mm -hmm. So we got used to our doctors think of a lot of things. A lot of things, sure. uh -huh. But with time, with uh, more exposure and as the years go by, I think you get the best care if you go straight to your specialist. Mm -hmm. So the concept of specialist care is now gaining grounds okay. in, in our setup. Okay. Uh -huh. Where, okay, I have the Ogun City specialist. Because here that's what used to be, oh, go to your doctor, doctor mm -hmm. could do. So our general doctors were doing a lot of things mm -hmm. uh -huh, to make up for the not so many specialists who were there not there. But now a lot of specialists have come up. Mm. That's mm. Th then I think that's, mm. that's a good thing because a lot of people are going into the medical school right now. So if we say we are going to just make them treat everybody, like general issues like that, I think we'll have a lot of people not being attended to because if we have specialists and probably the person comes with um, an issue that a specialist like a gynecologist will need to handle he or she wouldn't need to be in the queue for the general thing so I think that's that's actually a good thing well I think the, the special what a specialist brings on board is more definitely more qualitative more refined care mm -hmm. in the sense that if you do have a problem that falls in the domain of specialist your life will get a more proper tailor-made management solution exactly. than seeing a general Gen practice. Okay. Uh -huh. Because they also, by virtue of their training, have limits. So at, beyond a certain point, they can't do much for you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So at that point, they will refer you to see the specialist. Uh -huh. If there's no specialist, then they will sort of try and carry along and do something in the interim. But that might not be the best of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have been practicing for a long time now, like 14 years. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future holds for gynecologists in Africa? Well, I think that going forward, um, it becomes the era of sub-specialization. So there are sub-divisions or sub-areas in gynecology, like reproductive, uh, endocrinology, fertility, oncology dealing with gynecological cancers, maternal fetal medicine deal with only women in there unborn baby. Uh -huh. There are subdivisions. Uh -huh. I'm sure you've heard about when somebody, a Nigerian doctor, led an operation to operate on a baby who wasn't born yet. Mm -hmm. Take it and put it back. Yeah. That's a subdivision of gynae, which is maternal fetal medicine. Mm -hmm. So that's a subspecialization. Okay. Uh -huh. So going forward, that's where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. Where after doing a general gynecology training or certificate, you given a chance to go find out where you like best. And there were six or seven specializations in it. In it. So I think that's what the continent will have to benefit from. Mm -hmm. The next may be projected maybe 20 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. Because they'll give you a finer approach to the thing. I see. Mm. What would you like to tell students or anybody watching that would want to do gynecology? Well, I think the first thing <laughs> will be they will have to have the passion to do medicine. Okay. They don't need to have their head. Like, okay. I think passion is one. Okay. If you are passionate enough, you find yourself learning and passing your exams. Exactly. Which is what is needed. You know, uh -huh. so the passion and interest should be there. Because some, some enter medical school with a mindset of, oh, maybe I'm doing this to satisfy my parents. They pushed me here. Mm -hmm. Or oh, it comes to some prestige, I want to be here. Uh -huh. But when the reality hits when you enter the clinic, you realize that I'm not cut out for this because now I see people who have problems. And people who are not well, patients are generally not so nice, always. Because I have a problem, I fix it for me. So you get interact with the human mm -hmm. aspect yeah. of things. Uh -huh. Maybe you also have your own attitudes, so you are struggling to deal with it. Uh -huh. Then you realize that okay, you have to do longer hours, a lot of reading, almost all your life, you know. Because the things you know by the time you medical school, they have changed. Mm -hmm. So when you start working, you need to relearn the new things. 
medicine is evolving, new research, new science, exactly. So it's a lifetime of learning, reading books. That may not be your thing. Some people feel at the point I should close their books and look for money or do business or whatever. If you have that mindset, you probably can't be into medicine because it's a lifetime of learning. Uh -huh. It's a knowledge and skill that puts you on top. So that is there. The long hours you have to sacrifice, you know, and then at the point you may have no social life. That also is there if you are ready for that. Because at the point all your friends will go and say, Yeah, in school. They'll call you one, oh let's go party, I'm not available. Mm -hmm. By that time they won't call you again because they know the answer already. I'm not available. That's how it goes. So you yeah, should be ready for that sacrifice. And even with family, mm -hmm. it happens, you know, because <laughs> sometimes I remember when I was I have I come from, I have an older sibling who's a pediatrician. Okay. Than me. So I remember the days that my mom, who used to brag all over the neighborhood, oh, I have two doctors, I have two doctors. There was a day that I was on call, my sister was on call. Then we were working in hospitals close by, so the ambulance came one after the other to the house, pick my sister. This was like dead at night, 1 or 2 a.m. They came and pick me up, so they started complaining. You wouldn't let me sleep. I was like, but you say you have two doctors, but I can tell the whole way I have two doctors. This is what it means, you know, but that's, that's, that's how it means. Yeah. So, it's, it takes a toll on people around you, you know. So I think that, that that's 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 the thing. If you really want to do this, mm -hmm. it begins with the mindset. You just have to put your mind to it. And it will be good if you do a rotation and attachment. Mm -hmm. If you can get a chance to, in a hospital, follow one or shadow one guy or even a simple general doctor mm -hmm. to see for some time to see if it's really your thing. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, you know, because that 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 is the challenge. And sometimes even the size of blood. Yeah, I actually started wanting to be a nurse. Well, I just wanted to be work in the hospital, but I realized it wasn't my thing, so I had to switch. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. those, those are the realities. Yeah. So it may sound good on paper, but when they put you there, you're like, mm, this is not my you thing. Can't. So yeah. I think that if you are thinking along, it's good to think along, but then mm. whilst you are doing the education bit, it will be good to enter yeah. a place okay. and then follow, you know. I see. And it happens. I mean, I've I had I know of two, two people who, when senior high, came around those days, mm -hmm. shadowed us, blah blah blah. Today they are doctors. Wow. <laughs> so, it's 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 it's. I'm sure we made a good impression on them. Yeah. Then, you know. So I think that that that's also works. My final question, and we had we are we'll be, we'll be out of here. Is um, is the job lucrative? <laughs> Look creative. Okay. How do I define that? Way? Because that is that is all we are looking for. Like if this is satisfying in terms of money and all of that, do you think Well, I think it's okay. Um I have people who would also disagree with this mm. because it depends on what your expectations are. Okay. Yeah, some some people okay. I wanna have a fabulous life. Okay. Similar to what the celebrities mm -hmm. of go on holidays mm -hmm. on the island somewhere, <laughs> ride Ferraris. It might not fetch you that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, okay. If I should put it that way. Mm -hmm. But that's another then I have no people who own Rolls Royces and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, so doctors. So. <laughs> well, it's, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. I'm glad that you're able to make it here. Sure to Welcome. give us all of this information. Students mm -hmm. really needed to hear all of that and we are very, very grateful. So thank you, Dr. Kwejo Wuswansa. Mm -hmm. And thank you too for tuning in. You can join in the conversation via social media handles at AE underscore TV on Twitter, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, and at AE TV Official on Instagram. My name is Aja Omi, and don't forget, the CGC show is proudly brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I'll be back next week, same time, with another episode. Do enjoy.